Chapter 8 Elections It is highly unlikely when libertarian municipalists demand that existing municipal governments surrender their powers to citizens' assemblies that those governments will accede. Libertarian municipalists should therefore run for local elective office themselves so that ultimately they can change the city charter to create fully empowered citizens' assemblies at the expense of the state. Nor is it highly likely that libertarian municipalist candidates running for office on such a demand would achieve immediate victory. Their electoral campaigns would initially be educational efforts to school citizens in the basic ideas of libertarian municipalism. All of the literature that the group has produced could be brought to bear in such a campaign. But for the campaign itself, a specific document is required, a political platform that summarises the group's ideas in concise form. The electoral platform should consist of a series of demands that represent the ideas for which the group is fighting. Above all, the radical democratisation of the municipal government through the creation of citizens' assemblies. But it is not enough merely to call for direct democracy. The platform should offer the steps by which that goal can be met. Indeed, it should make a series of clearly specified immediate demands, then place them in a radical context by tying them to the longer-term goal of fundamentally transforming society. For libertarian municipalism is a revolutionary movement, not a reformist movement, and it aims not to reform the existing system, but to replace it with a liberatory one. In programmatic terms, these immediate and long-term goals can be called respectively minimum and maximum demands. Minimum demands are those that are immediately realisable within the existing system. They are specific and concrete. Maximum demands, by contrast, are more general. They comprise the rational society that the group hopes to ultimately achieve. The minimum demands should be formulated in such a way that they lead or phase into the maximum demands. Linking them in this way, the programme should also contain transitional demands for the creation and expansion of social alternatives. Fulfilling a specific minimum demand, then fulfilling its more enlarged transitional form, should thus lead into the fulfilment of a more generalised maximum demand. For example, a minimum demand to, quote, change the city charter to establish citizens' assemblies, unquote, could be followed by a statement of intention to expand those assemblies to achieve the long-term goal or maximum demand of direct democracy. Another minimum demand that the platform could articulate might be to end the invasion of megastores and malls in the area. The maximum demand would be to replace the market economy with a moral economy, one that is concerned with needs instead of profits. As a transition, the programme could call for the municipality to initiate enterprises owned by itself that, as they expanded, could supplant the market economy. Another minimum demand could be to preserve a wetland. Its associated maximum demand could be to create an ecological society. Still, another immediate demand could be to set up daycare centres and shelters for battered women. This demand could be part of the long-term goal of attaining social justice for the society as a whole. The electoral platform should always contain the group's name and contact information so that interested people may communicate with it. The platform may also be used for public education, not only when the group is running candidates for municipal office, but at all times, in between elections as well as during them. It should be clearly understood by the members of the group that libertarian municipalism is not an effort to construct a progressive or more environmentally friendly city government by electing enlightened candidates to the city council. Such a reformist direction would neutralise the movement's effort to create and enlarge citizens' assemblies and its larger aim of transforming society. Rather, candidates should emphasise as often as they can that their movement's maximum aim is to create a direct democracy in their municipality and beyond. The Campaign as Public Education Those members whom the group chooses to run for local office should ideally be individuals who are most capable 
of articulating libertarian municipalist ideas and the most comfortable doing so. For in the short term, libertarian municipalist campaigns will serve the continuing goal of public education as occasions for the group to publicise their ideas and to spark public discussion. On every occasion, in interviews, debates and speeches, the candidates should call for the creation of citizens' assemblies and advocate direct democracy. Candidates' debates are particularly desirable arenas in this respect, while leafleting door-to-door is an invaluable way to call general public attention to the platform and the ideas it contains. The Libertarian Municipalist Group should understand that its candidates are running for office not as personalities, but as spokespersons for the ideas contained in the group's platform. It is these ideas that the campaign is offering to the public for its approval or disapproval, not the individual personalities of the candidates. As for the candidates themselves, they are always accountable to the group for their political behaviour and not to the advancement of their own personal interests. The best venues for the campaigns are debates attended by citizens, where the latter voice their concerns and raise questions. Such events are occasions for generating the face-to-face political realm that is essential to a direct democracy. Media coverage may seem more effective than face-to-face discourse, because it can reach more people, but the group should approach the media with caution. For one thing, it puts community political participation at a remove. It is no longer face-to-face and thus vitiates the inclusiveness that libertarian municipalism seeks, perpetuating the isolation of ordinary people from public affairs. It also insulates candidates and ideas from the searching inquiry and challenge that face-to-face contact renders possible. But what is also important is that regular commercial television news reporting is by definition biased toward the status quo and basically against the libertarian municipalist movement. While some reporters may be sympathetic to the movement, local commercial television stations will most likely be oriented towards the interests of their advertisers. Their news coverage, when not entirely hostile, could transform the libertarian municipalist candidates into media performers and degrade the political discourse to the level of entertainment, offering not only sound bites and photo opportunities, rather than thorough coverage. The group's best use of broadcast media is likely to be local public access television, which often debates full, unedited, unbroken coverage of meetings and debates. Electoral failure The present period of political reaction in much of the world will probably preclude immediate electoral success for the campaign even in a community that is small and relatively progressive. In the foreseeable future, libertarian municipalist candidates will most likely lose whatever electoral races they run. Least of all, in the 1990s, can a revolutionary minority hope to gain rapid, widespread public support. A considerable amount of time may have to pass before the movement attains even modest electoral success. But in reactionary times such as these, paradoxical as it may seem, electoral success is not something a libertarian municipalist movement should focus on. Although they should definitely participate in electoral campaigns, winning a campaign should not be a decisive matter. In too many instances, radical alternative movements have attained electoral success before their ideas become part of public consciousness, at the cost of their basic principles. They received votes because citizens agreed not with their larger aims, but only with their minimum, often reformist goals. Public education on their maximum goals for a rational society had not taken place. As a result, a wide disparity developed between the political level of the movement and that of the citizens. Yet the candidates, once elected to office, were accountable to those citizens who had voted for them, not to their movement's platform, which inevitably attenuated the radicalism of their ideas in the interests of electoral success, in inverted commas. A case in point is the green movements that emerged in the late 1970s and early 1980s in many European countries, most notably Germany. Originally a countercultural movement, the Greens were ostensibly bent 
on reconstructing society along more ecological lines. In the early 1980s, Greens entered the elections for the German federal parliament and won enough votes to qualify 20-odd members to enter. The party rationalised that these new Green parliamentarians suddenly thrust into the public limelight would use their state offices only as a platform to educate the public. But expectations soon rose that the parliamentarians would be able to pass progressive, ecologically enlightened laws and that they should actively strive to do so. But passing such legislation was possible only because it did not disturb the existing system. Once achieving such legislation became the goal, the party was no longer radical. One by one, to increase the number of votes it received, the party shared its radical demands. The result was that the party was quickly absorbed into the institutions of the state. In the early 1990s, after the Greens issued a statement on capitalism that took positions markedly to the right of the Vatican, the principled left wing of the party finally left in disgust. At present, the remaining Greens work entirely within the existing system. Indeed, they appear to be eager to work with conventional parties, including the Christian Democrats, at whatever cost to their principles. Similar developments occurred in Britain, France and Italy, as well as the United States, albeit on a smaller scale. To avoid this kind of reverse education, a libertarian municipalist movement must expect to grow slowly and organically and to patiently explain its ideas to ordinary citizens, educating them at every turn without being deflected by the inevitable setbacks. It must remember at all times that its goal is not to produce still more members of the local governmental elite. Rather, its unwavering goal must be to recreate the political realm that allows for the greatest possible degree of direct democracy. To create that realm, the movement must educate the public and refuse to permit itself to be tamed by the state. The story of the Greens may lead some libertarian municipalists to refuse to participate in any elections at all even local elections, but local campaigns are a first-rate venue for educational activity. Despite the vicissitudes of elections and despite the potentially demoralising effects of losing campaigns, participating in elections should remain a consistent and ongoing part of libertarian municipalist practice. As soon as the movement adheres to its goals and principles, it will be building a meaningful alternative to the present society, a municipal direct democracy. What libertarian municipalists should not do, difficult as it may be, is guide their activities by the number of votes they receive in any particular election, or spend long evenings contemplating and analysing the percentages of the various contenders. Such preoccupations invariably lead to one or two outcomes, either to despair or to desire for electoral success on any terms, as happened to the Greens. Rather than merely seek ever more votes from community members, the group should emphasise quality over quantity. It should be satisfied with a small but slowly growing group of highly conscious members and adherents, rather than seek a large number of voters who are only faintly acquainted with libertarian municipalist ideas, that is, a constituency, in inverted commas, only in a community whose political and democratic consciousness has been raised by the movement would it be desirable for a libertarian municipalist candidate to actually win an election. But when and if the citizens do elect a libertarian municipalist candidate to office because they agree with the group's platform, the candidate should remain accountable both to the platform and to the citizenry by immediately commencing the work of creating assemblies and democratising the municipal government. He or she should aggressively introduce charter changes to create citizens' assemblies, or where they already exist, to give them increasing power, including the legal power, to formulate binding policies for the municipality as a whole. Libertarian anti-electoralism Many individualistic anarchists will object that such experiences as that of the Greens are endemic to any movement that enters into elections. They reject a libertarian municipalist approach precisely because it involves participation in elections, even municipal ones structured around direct democracy. 
municipal elections, they argue, are a piece of state and provincial and national elections, and municipal office holders are qualitatively no different from office holders in a nation state. Presumably, anyone who is consistently anti statist must reject local elections and municipalist politics. Opposition to the state is amply warranted, but statism is not the same thing as electoralism. Participation in municipal elections and city councils hardly amounts to statecraft, especially when a libertarian movement is consciously directing this participation against the state. See chapter 12. Cities and states derive from two entirely different traditions that have waged a recurring power struggle against each other, even in France with its notoriously centralised state system. To participate in municipal elections with the intention of democratising the municipality and pitting it against the state is to take the side of the anti-statists in this ongoing struggle. These anarchists, it should be noted, make no tripartite division of society into the social, state and political realms. In particular, they negate the political realm by confusing it with the state, by accepting the conventional interchangeability of politics with statecraft, a confusion that plays directly into the hands of statists. The battle against the state, in their eyes, is to be waged by the social realm, that is, by alternative social groups, like cooperatives, and not by the political realm, whose very existence they deny. Yet anarchism itself has always contained a communalist tendency, alongside its individualistic and cultural strains. Communalism holds out the ideal of decentralised, stateless and collectively managed communes, or communities, in essence of confederated municipalities. The orientation of this communalist tendency has long been municipalist, as can be gleaned from the writings of both Bakunin and Kropotkin. Bakunin saw, for example, that municipal councils are basic to people's political lives. The people, he wrote, quote, have a healthy, practical common sense when it comes to communal affairs. They are fairly well informed and know how to select from their midst the most capable officials. This is why municipal elections always best reflect the real attitude and will of the people. Unquote. The political core of the communalist tendency, however, has not been sufficiently articulated in social anarchist writings. It is a lacuna that libertarian municipalism proposes to fill. Extra legal assemblies. In many places, a libertarian municipalist group will find that the municipality has no charter or that the city council or other municipal body consistently blocks its efforts to change the charter to empower citizens' assemblies. A libertarian municipalist council member may well find it impossible to persuade the rest of the council to legalise citizens' assemblies, or perhaps the community has not reached the stage where libertarian municipalist council members can even be elected. In such cases, the group can create extra-legal citizens' assemblies on its own initiative and convene them, appealing to all citizens of the community to attend and participate in them. These assemblies could meet on a regular basis and debate local, regional, national and even international issues if they so desire, issuing resolutions and public statements as expressions of their views. To give the meeting structure, the participants should adopt a formal set of rules by which to conduct their affairs and establish them as bylaws. Finally, they could define the political powers that they ultimately claim for themselves. Even assemblies that have no legal power could nonetheless exercise enormous moral power, as more and more citizens saw the significance and attended their meetings. The existing municipal structures might well have no choice ultimately but to give them a measure of legal, structural power. Once this minimum step is taken, a transitional programme of expanding the assemblies' power could be undertaken. As popular democracy matures, as attendance at assemblies flourishes, as citizens make these institutions their own, the assemblies could acquire ever greater de facto power. Ultimately, the city charter would have to be changed to recognise this new popular power, to affirm that the assemblies hold sovereign power in the community. 
Thereafter, the assemblies would work to achieve the maximum demands of a libertarian municipalist polity, the confederation of municipal assemblies and the creation of a rational society. How rapidly the self-managed public sphere is institutionalised in these assemblies will obviously depend on the consciousness of the people. Much patience, it should be emphasised, will be required of the libertarian municipalist group, but its political venture has potentially sweeping possibilities for a broad transformation of political life.